It's my uh, very great pleasure now to introduce Dr. Ramachandran. He is the director of the Brain and Cognition Center at UCSD, and he's also, of course, uh, hugely participating at the Salk Institute. He's been named by Newsweek as one of the top 100 people to watch in the next century, and was named by Richard Dawkins, the Marco Polo of neuroscience. Please welcome Dr. Ramachandran. Let's, my, my, what I do is research on the human brain. So let's pause for a minute and ask ourselves what we're dealing with. So you need, inside the cranial cavity, there's this lump of flesh, three pounds, weighing three pounds. And this lump of flesh asks questions about interstellar space, the vastness of interstellar space, ask questions about the meaning of infinity, ask questions about itself asking questions and its own place in the cosmos. And how does this come about? It's 100 billion nerve cells firing away in the brain, creating a whole spectrum of abilities we call human consciousness or human nature. So my approach has been to look at uh, lesions in different parts of the brain producing characteristic changes in behavior. What you get when there's a lesion is not just an across-the-board reduction in all your mental capacities, but often a highly selective loss in one mental ability with relative preservation of other abilities. So that gives you some confidence that that region of the brain is specialized for that function. Now in today's lecture, what I'd like to do is to focus on three aspects of human nature which we regard as unique and human beings are especially good at. You, perhaps we're the only creatures even capable of it. One is humor and laughter. Okay, what is the brain basis and ev evolution of humor and laughter? And the second question would be uh, empathy and the origin of civilization, culture and civilization in humans. And the third question would be creativity. What makes us creative? And I'm going to cover all that in the next 20 minutes. Okay, let's first talk about... Um, let, me, let me begin with um, empathy and human nature. Or let me begin with humor. Okay, It's always fun to do. So, humor and laughter... Let, let me begin with a patient, a patient named Mickey, who I saw not long ago. And I was doing a routine neurological testing on this patient, uh, t testing her touch sensations, touching various parts of her body, and it was all completely normal. Mentally, she was normal fluent in conversation, attentive, to, everything was fine. Then I poked over the needle as part of the neurological exam, different parts of her body, what do you feel? Ouch, that hurts. Don't poke, poke too hard, okay? So, okay, so she said, that, that's painful, that's painful. And then many patches of body, when I, when I touched her, she would say, ha ha, and she'd start giggling like crazy. So here's a human being laughing at the face of pain. It's the ultimate oxymoron. How can a person laugh when poked with a needle, right? So why does this happen? It got me, got me start thinking about humor and laughter in general. Why did humor evolve? If a Martian ethologist was watching all of you here in the audience, every now and then you'd stop and start shaking your head and making this funny ha 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 noise. And you'd be extremely puzzled. Why does this happen? Why do creatures, why do humanoids do this? So I started thinking about this, and then I realized that, first of all, it's probably universal. It's probably hardwired in the brain because every culture, every civilization, every country has some form of laughter and humor, except Germans. Okay. <laughs> uh, and among animals, of course, there's no humor but you know, of any kind. So the question is, given it's hardwired in the brain, why? Why does it ex exist? Well, when you look at humor and laughter, you see it has the following form. All jokes, you know, humorous incidents, humorous narratives, you lead the path along, you lead the the, the person along a garden path of expectation. And at the very end, you're building up a story, you introduce a sudden twist uh, or punchline that entails a complete reinterpretation of all the previous data. And that's what you call humor. Now, now that's necessary, but it's not sufficient. Supposing this guy is building up an elaborate scientific theory and you prick the bubble and you say it's wrong, and it entails a complete reinterpretation, he won't think it's funny, okay? <laughs> Believe me, I've tried a lot. <laughs> So what makes it funny? Okay, let's take slapstick. A chap is walking along, preferably a portly, self-important gentleman, walking along the road. There's a banana peel and suddenly slips and falls down. Okay, so you're building up an expectation that the gentleman will reach his destination, but he doesn't, he slips on a banana peel, falls down. Now, if he falls down and cracks his skull and blood starts spilling out, you won't laugh. Hopefully not. You'll go and call the ambulance or you'll rush to his aid, tell people rush to his aid and all of that. But supposing he slips on the banana peel, falls down, and then wipes it off and looks all around him. Then you start laughing. 
It's the basis of all slapstick comedy. So what's the key difference between the two scenarios? The key difference is, in the first case, there's been a genuine alarm. Your alarm bells start ringing. Genuine danger. So you call the ambulance, you do something appropriate, you orient. In the second case, your brain realizes this is a false alarm. And you don't want people rushing to his aid and wasting their energy and resources. So this is your nature's false alarm bell. By laughing and producing a characteristic sound, you're telling everybody, your kin, who share your genes, don't waste your resources rushing to this chap's aid. So this is my theory. Now, how do you test this? Let's go back to my patient, Mickey, who, had, who used to laugh and giggle every time I poked her. How do you explain that? Well, you go and look inside her brain. Um, it turns out there's an area called the insular cortex, insular cortex in the temporal lobes, on the sides of the brain, and that insular cortex sends projections indirectly to the anterior cingulate. The insular cortex is the region of the brain that receives pain, the sensation of pain. The pain sensory signals go to the insular cortex. And then there's a wire that goes from there to the anterior cingulate, which experiences the agony of pain. Ow! Okay, that, that. So pain, in fact, we think of a single, single thing, but in fact has many steps involved, many stages, many layers of pain involved, starting from mere sensory signals all the way to the ex subjective experience of agony, the aversive quality of pain. Now that wire was cut in her. So what's going on in her brain? Initially, there's an alarm saying, potential alarm saying, hey, something painful is coming in. The very next second, the anterior signal is saying, but nothing is happening. It's not painful. The two ingredients are in place, a potential alarm, then deflation of alarm saying there's no danger, and the guy starts giggling uncontrollably. So here is an aspect of human nature, namely humor, which you would think is inaccessible to experiments. You can do an experiment and show these pathways that are involved in the brain, and also tell you about the evolution, and perhaps the function, all of that in one simple patient, one single patient. Right? Now, we still don't know if this is true or not, but you can do brain imaging to test it. Now, the other thing, of course, is tickling. Same sound you produce. Why would there be tickling? Well, think of what happens. The menacing adult approaches the child about to do something nasty, and they say, chuk, 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 chuk. And I don't mean anything. So again, there's a al potential alarm and the deflation of the alarm. And I think tickling is rehearsal for adult humor, okay? <laughs> uh, so to speak. Now, what, when, what other situations do you laugh? And I won't, that's a whole lecture, I won't go into it. The second part of the lecture was about um, creativity. How do you study creativity? Now, we latched onto this when we saw a phenomenon called synesthesia. And this is first reported by Francis Galton, who was Charles Darwin's first cousin in the 19th century. And uh, he noticed that some people who were completely normal otherwise had the following peculiarities, following quirk in their brain. And that is every time they saw, <coughs> they saw a particular number, the number would be tinged with a particular color. So red is, five is red, six is green, seven is blue, eight is chartreuse, nine is indigo, and so on and so forth. And sometimes tones were colored, C sharp is blue, F sharp is green, and so on and so forth. Now, why would this happen? Now, one of the first things I did was, hey, this chap is saying numbers are colored, okay? What if I give him, instead of, instead of Arabic numbers, I mean, actually, I call them Indian numbers, they come from India. <laughs> so uh, uh, so you, take, you take Indian Arabic numbers, instead of that, you show him Roman numbers, V or V1 or whatever, what does he see colors? An obvious experiment. And he says, no, I don't see any colors. So, this is not, so what this is proving is not the numerical concept of sequentiality, ordinality, cardinality is driving the color, it's the visual appearance of the number. So we started experimenting on this and we found that there's a structure called, can we, next slide, thank you. Next slide, they're just showing you neurons, you all know about it, next slide. Uh, maybe we'll leave it there. Okay, next slide, sorry. Uh, skip all that, it's all phantom limb stuff. Skip all that. So, sorry, keep, keep, keep skipping. Keep skipping, sorry, it's another lecture here. Keep skipping. Um, you should get to a point where it's just synesthesia. Okay, ne next slide. Next slide, sorry. Next slide. <laughs> this is going to take up the entire talk. Next slide. <laughs> next slide. Two more slides and there's a brain image. There it is. Okay. If you take a slice through the brain, a coronal section, what you find is the number area is right there, the red circle. It's in the fusiform gyrus of the brain. And the color area is also right next to it in the fusiform gyrus of the brain. Then I said to myself, what's the likelihood that these two areas, color and number, are almost touching each other in the fusiform gyrus? And the most common form of synesthesia is number to color. Maybe there's some sloppy wiring here. Every time he sees a number, he sees a color. Also, in the fusiform, it's the visual appearance of the number that's represented, not the high-level concept. So that fits the observation that Roman numbers don't evoke colors. Okay? 
All right, so far so good. Now, how did we prove this? We'll do a whole, whole bunch of experiments, but mainly we did brain imaging. If you take a normal person, show them numbers, the number area lights up. If you show a normal person, colored numbers, number and colored area lights up. If you show a synesthete, black and white numbers, number and colored area lights up. Not only that, people have now done diffusion tensor imaging and actually wires, cross wiring between these two areas. Now you say, well, what's all this got to do with creativity and all that? First of all, you have to ask yourself, why does this happen? Why do some people have this quirk? What I found was, contrary to previous claims, one out of 50 people has this condition. So there may be one or two of you here who have not come out. Okay? So one out of 50 people has synesthesia. Now, why would one out of 50 people have this condition? Well, the secret comes from the fact that in the fetus or in the infant brain, everything is connected to everything. I mean, that's not strictly accurate, but there's a tremendous redundancy of connections in the brain. And as the brain develops, the excess connections get pruned away to create the characteristic modular architecture of the adult brain. Okay? Now, this is done by pruning gene or pruning genes in the brain. Supposing there's a mutation of the pruning gene, then you get inadequate pruning between adjacent brain regions. And if some of the genes are expressed selectively in the number color region, in the fusiform gyrus, then you're going to get color excess connections between those regions in the fusiform gyrus, namely number and color. So every time he sees a number, he sees a color. Now you say, what's this got to do with creativity? Well, it turns out, people have known for a long time, synesthesia is about seven times more common among artists, poets, and novelists than in the rest of the population. People didn't know why. In fact, the common idea is about